hello guys welcome back to another video and today back from popular due to popular demand i am here to make another elite uh tier list where basically i'm going to go through each nation one at a time and rank all of their elites according to um these putting them into these five categories um so this is a series that i did um just under two years ago and obviously since then we've had three full expansions come out um, rotation has been implemented, although I'm still going to be covering all the cards, not just the cards in current standard rotation. So if you're newer to the game, you might be seeing a lot of cards you might not recognize. Um, but I figured that enough time has passed and enough new cards have been introduced, as well as the meta has changed and certain things will affect um, the placement of certain cards. So for example, uh, everything with destruction has gotten a lot weaker now that suppress is such a common uh, and powerful mechanic that's just an example um so today we are going to be starting with britain but first i do want to quickly um go over uh basically how i'm going to rank these so to be very very clear this is not a crafting guide please do not use this as a crafting guide if you have questions about what cards you want to craft if you are a newer player and you have limited wild cards you have a limited collection Please ask that to myself or to other people. Um, do not just pick the highest rated thing here. Um, and that's for a couple different reasons. So one, um, this is a tier list for sort of the effective power level of a card beyond just the current meta. This is not going to be ranking the cards on how good they are at this exact moment in the game. Um, it is going to be how good they are in this exact moment in the game and how good they will probably be moving forward. Um, and two, you might have a card that's S tier, but it requires a deck with 10 other elites to be S tier. Um, as so if you, you know, have a completely small collection, you might be better off crafting an A tier card or an A tier elite that's going to be an auto include in everything, but it might be slightly lower power level even though it's easier to fit into decks at a low collection so again very clear this is not a crafting guide um but yeah past s tier which um is basically just a card that i think is broken to the point where either they have to design other cards they release around this card or it's just a card that literally needs a nerf um so there's a couple things that I might call a S tier broken card, but that doesn't necessarily feel like an S tier broken card, and that's because they have to design the game around this to prevent this from being like the best card in the game. Um, so yeah, there's there's a couple of examples of that, uh, and then A tier is either um just a cornerstone card of an archetype, so like a card that makes an archetype work, or it is a card that's just sort of a top notch auto include. You throw it in basically every single deck. Um, B is good elites that you can run in good decks. However, they are not an auto-include. Um, C is just sort of bad elites you will probably never run. And then D is either just terrible elites that will absolutely never be run, or elites that fit a very specific archetype that has zero support currently in the game. Um, so there's, there's going to be a couple things like that will go into that category where it's like this elite is not necessarily bad it very well like in a, a year from now if they push the archetype heavily it could be like an a tier or even an s tier card um however at the moment there is literally no sign of this archetype working there's no sign of this archetype being anything other than complete trash um and that's sort of what differentiates the s tier and the d tier in terms of things that are not supported is if a card's not supported at all and the archetype is just actively bad and it doesn't seem like 1939 is helping the archetype, it's going to go in D tier. If it's a card that is still kind of good and you can very easily see a world with just like a couple of cards that 1939 could reasonably print and suddenly this card's the best card in the game, that's probably going to go into S tier because that sounds like a card that is a little overtuned. Um, so with all of that caveat out of the way, let's roll the intro and then get into the actual tier list. What a performance there by J King. J King, full plot armor. J King is pushing himself into the ranks of the legend. J King is our world champion. J King 7. What? The back to back cards world champion.
Alrighty, so I, I have the cards here in no particular order. Um, so the first up we have is the third Canadian division. Um, and this is a card that came out in Winter War. It's the four cost, four, five guard salvage with the passive effect. Your salvage units cost two less to deploy, I believe. Um, so like this is, it's a four cost, four, five guard with a good effect. Like salvage is just a fine keyword. Um, so it's certainly not bad. So it's certainly not D tier and... It's probably not C tier. It's probably just a B tier card. Like, you would consider running this in certain control decks that don't even have a salvage package. Um, just because a 4 cost 4 or 5 guard salvage is not bad. Um, and within a salvage package, it is good. But, like, it's not good enough to be a cornerstone of the deck. It's not good enough to make the deck particularly great. It is just a decent card inside a salvage package that is winning off of other cards. Like, the finished cards. Um, but... Canadian Division, it's, it's a fine card. Then we have the 6th Air Landing. Uh, I think it's the 6th Air Landing. It is the 1-4 Fury. When your units would deal 1 combat damage, deal 3 instead. Um, so this has seen a quite a bit of play um, inside of Air Decks in particular, um, where you have a lot of 1 attack cards to begin with. So your Swordfishes, your Gladiators, your Elbacores, um, now your Sharks. And, you know, having a 1-3 bomber that can hit for 3 can be quite strong. Um, I'm a big fan of this card. And then even once you play, like, a close air support uh, and buff things to 2 attack and this effect will stop triggering, you still have a then a 2-5 Fury, which is not a bad card. You can get that to the front line, protect your support line, you can hit something twice. Um, it will still activate your other non-buffed cards that you might play later. Um, I think it's just a really good card. That being said, is it A tier or B tier? Um, it's certainly better than the Canadians. But I don't know if I can necessarily put it up into A tier. Um, yeah, I'll put it up into A tier because it is one of those cards that, in specific archetypes, it's not necessarily the, a cornerstone of a deck, um, but in specific archetypes, it can be one of those play on turn two and just stomp the game type of cards. Because it can be very difficult for your opponent to remove a 1-4, which is effectively a 3-4. It's effectively a 2-cost 3-4 that's also buffing all of your other units. Um, and, you know, if you're playing against Frontline, you're playing against, um, to a lesser extent, Jagro, if you're playing against Hines, um, this can just absolutely snowball you off the board by turn, like, 3, turn 4. Um, and e even later in the game, against, like, a control deck, you might have a bunch of 1-attack um, units on the board that aren't doing much, and then you slam down a 6 airland brigade and then suddenly you can trade out several large units um i think it's just a, a very good card that um might go sort of under the radar uh quite a bit then we have a different uh airland brigade or no, no this is a parachute brigade i think um this card is rotated it's a three cost three five deployment retreat a unit from the front line um if the front line is empty gain blitz uh so it's a very weird card to use. Um, this is also a very, very weird card for them to have rotated because this card was previously smokescreen. Um, and when this unit attacks another unit and that unit survives, retreat it. And it saw no play. It was just an absolutely terrible D, D tier card for a very long time. And then they changed it to its current version and then immediately rotated it before anybody really had a chance to see how good the current version is. Um, so... It is hard to rate this card because it's never really seen any serious attempted play in its current iteration. With that being said, I would imagine it's somewhere in between B and C tier, um, where I, I would go B, um, lower B. I will rank the cards within their ranks, um, so Canadian is better than the Parachute. And it's because it's just a little niche. Um, there's situations where it's a little difficult to use, and even when you can trigger it, it's not fantastic. Like, a 3-cost, three 3-4 three, infantry blitz is already kind of low tier. Like, it's already, like, you need a good upside. Um, so a 3-cost, three 3-5 three, blitz, it's good, but it's not, it, it's a conditional blitz. And if you're retreating something, then it's a conditional blitz that's good. Um... 
that that's like giving you additional upside but there's a lot of times where it's not going to be doing that it's basically a three cost three five or tweet something in the front line do nothing um and that's a little weaker and also it's just doesn't fit Britain's other synergies. Britain likes to be sort of sit back, turtle, play lots of guards, play lots of heal, play lots of board clears. Or if you're doing like a sort of combo deck, they like to be very order heavy and very, very high tempo. Just play a lot of things and the only units you slam down are cheap guards. Um, this doesn't fit either of those archetypes. This is sort of like a more unit based board presence deck, um, which Britain doesn't have. So that's why it's going in B tier. It, could be good in the future if they bring it back and there's certain decks that fit it. Um, then we have ATS, which is a three cost order. Give your opponent's HQ. When this takes three damage, you draw a card. Um, so it's Britain's version of the HQ card. And this used to be four and it was so bad they nerfed, they buffed it to three. And you'll still you'll see people play it from time um, to time, like in exile or... Um, like Britain, France, Burn, Britain, US, Burn, um, where you're just playing a lot of Burn cards, or in Exile, you're playing, well, I mean, in Exile, you're also playing a lot of Burn cards. Um, and essentially, the idea is you're playing stuff like Sea Patrol, and you play up ATS, you're trying to deal damage to the opponent's HQ, you have cards in hand which directly deal damage to the opponent's HQ, and they will draw you cards. The issue is you have to be able to confidently trigger this more than twice for it to be better than Convoy. And even then, it's still a question of isn't Convoy better because you get the cards immediately? Um, and then you don't have to sink additional credits into triggering this. Um, so you realistically have to be triggering this like probably four times for it to be better than Convoy. And I don't think there's any deck in the world where you are consistently triggering this four times a game. Um, because the issue is you also, that's four different turns because it's a limit of once per turn. So you have to survive four turns while dealing, having four cards that deal damage to the opponent's HQ, why aren't you just running Convoy? Uh, and if you're running this on top of con like four Convoy, well, are you running Sincerely yours? Are you running Research? Because I think both of those are better. And then it gets to the point of, well, are you running MI5? Because MI5 might just be better even in like an aggro deck than ATS. ATS is just bad. It, there is nothing that supports it. And it's difficult to imagine what could support this um, to make it like, 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 on the one hand, it's like, oh, it's one extra card draw every turn for a burn strategy. That sounds really scary. But one, Britain just has basically no burn card support. And two, Britain has the best card draw in the game already. Britain running out of cards is not really an issue. And three, Britain doesn't really have a way to fish for ATS. Because Britain can fish for orders, but you need other orders to trigger ATS, which then dilutes your ability to fish for ATS. Um, so, like, if you could consistently have ATS in your opening hand to potentially play on turn 3, turn 4, turn 5 every single game, you could build a deck around that, and that'd be really good. The issue is you can't, and sometimes you're going to top deck this with no ability to burn, because you're top decking, because ATS is your card draw, um, and it's going to suck. And I don't really see a way where 1939 is going to change this card doing that. With all of that being said, just having this in your deck doesn't necessarily make your deck a ton worse. If you can trigger it twice, it's fine. And I feel like you can reasonably trigger this twice most of the time. So that's the thing that I, the, I'm putting it in C tier rather than D tier, is to really get into D tier, it has to be a card that both doesn't fit into any archetypes, or is bad in the archetypes it's trying to fit into, and also just negatively impacts your deck. Um, you know, think of Long Tom, where it's just a card where you play Long Tom on turn 5 and you lose the game. ATS, I think you can play and not lose the game immediately. Um, then we have another card, which is the Bowfighter. Not the new Bowfighter, it is the old Bowfighter, it is the Bomber Bowfighter. It's a 6 cost, 4-4 four, four Bomber. With the passive effect, when the enemy attacks this, deal 3 damage to their unit first. Um, so basically, it's like a permanent ambush for 3 damage. Um, and there are situations where that can be absolutely insane, and the opponent can't remove Bowfighter. The issue is, if your opponent can't remove Bowfighter, they're not going to trade all their units into Bowfighter. They're just going to put all of their units face, and then you have a 
you paid six cost for a four four bomber. Like, would you play six cost for a four four bomber that can't be removed by aggro decks? Probably not. That still just doesn't sound like a good card. And against control decks, they're just going to run stuff that can remove bow fighter. Um, like they'll either have units that have enough health, or they will have uh removal orders. So bow fighter just turns out to be a very very bad card. There's just so much better you can do. Um. Is it bad enough to go into terrible? I'm not sure. There's situations where Bowfighter is fine. Um, because it does it is intentionally in the category of removal check. Like it's just this big dumb thing you could throw out um and force your opponent to have removal for it. And unlike a lot of other really bad removal check cards, this one does actually have a pretty decent upside if your opponent can't remove it. A 4-4 bomber is not terrible, and also, it's very, like, it's harder to remove this than other cards. It actually has a defensive mechanic to it that makes up for the fact that it's a 6 cost 4-4. So, it's a bad card. Um, you shouldn't run this in your decks. Um, however, you know, if you, like, develop into it or something, um, it is currently rotated from the game, but if, they ever, if it ever comes back or if you're playing uh, classic mode, it's not an objectively unplayable card that being said is it better than ats probably not i think that i could see a world where ats like i think bowfighter is probably more playable as in if you pick it off of something like his majesty's chosen however if you are to put it into your deck at the start of the game i think ats is probably better um then we have the new bowfighter um this is the five cost four five fighter with the passive effect when you deploy a British air unit, or I forget if it's British air unit or just air units in general. Um, but when you deploy, I think it's a British air unit. Give it plus two, plus two. Um, and this was a big. This this card's relatively new, and there's a big discussion on whether or not this card should be played in air. Um, I was very skeptical of it, and for, at least from what I've seen, it looks like people have landed on no, this should not be played in air. Um, that being said, it always has the potential to see play in air later if the meta slows down. Um, or if, you know, things switch around. So, um, we're going to put it into B tier, where it's a good card. Um, the effect is powerful. It can snowball very quickly if your opponent doesn't have removal for it. Um, it's a fighter, so it will actually damage back if the opponent attacks into it. Um, as well as it offers a somewhat of a scary body of its own. So, uh, I would put it at the top of B tier. Um, it's better than Canadian, it's better than Parachute. But I don't think it is gets into A tier. I don't think it's nearly as good as Six Day Landing Brigade, or at least not nearly as consistently good across all betas. Then we have another new card from Covert Operations. We have the HMS Talbot. Um, so the HMS Talbot is a new countermeasure. Um, that's a one cost countermeasure. When your HQ would take lethal damage, give it plus six health. Um, so essentially, it's supposed to be a one cost heal six but it only works if your opponent would kill you. Um, which makes it very difficult to use, because it means you have to be low on health, so it doesn't have synergy with something like Commonwealth, for example. Um, and would you rather not just play, like, for example, Naval Power, where you heal three and also stop a unit from attacking rather than one cost heal six if your opponent would kill you? Um, it's very difficult to imagine a world where this is particularly useful, like this would be a card that you would be willing to spend a slot on, um, because Britain, again, just has better healing options. It's sort of like ATS, where it's like, if this, if this was a card for a different nation, maybe you would run this, a nation that doesn't really have access to healing. Um, or like, for example, with like, in Soviets, where you're playing like Great Patriotic War, or Self Damage, where you're lowering your own health total quickly. Um, but in Britain, you just have a ton of better healing options, and you typically want to be above 20 health for most of the game if you played anything slower or health-related. Um, so yeah, HMS Talbot is just a kind of a bad card. Um, in fact, I might even go as so far as to put it into terrible. I'm a little skeptical of this just because a one-cost card that doesn't, like, negatively impact you in terms of, like, you know, discard your hand or something. Um, a one-cost card is difficult to be terrible because, you know, it's not super expensive to hold up, and you, if you put it in your deck, you will have games where your opponent will 
deal lethal damage and then you have Talbot and they're not expecting it. Um, the issue is you then have to be able to win or at the very least turn the game around on the following turn. Um, because most people who try to kill you will kill you on board. There is very few decks that will kill you from hand with orders. Um, so HMS Talbot, like if it's stopping an OTK, that's really good. Um, I suppose there's like specific metas where like if Great Patriotic War OTK becomes like a, a tier one deck, it, it could see play. So like maybe I should put it up into the weak tier. Um, yeah, actually, honestly, the, the threat of Great Patriotic War existing in the game um, as is consistently going to be one of the best ways to make an OTK work. So I think that HMS Talbot's ability to stop OTKs makes it into C tier where there is a niche where you can run it and the niche where you can run it is much higher than ATS or Bowfighter. Um, but it's not a good card. Also, with them bringing back... Um, National Fire Service. National Fire Service just seems like a better way of accomplishing the same thing, but I suppose HMS Talbot is cheaper, it's easier to disguise, I guess. Um, I don't know. It's <laughs> it's not a good card. Um, then we get to the Churchill Offre, and this might be our first S-tier card. Uh, so Churchill Offre is a 7 cost, 5, 7 tank, heavy armor, 1 deployment, retreat all enemy ground units. And this is a very powerful effect. It's a very good body. It is easily one of Britain's best units. Now, is it high A tier or low S tier? That is the question. Um, I think it's got to go into S tier. This card is just absolutely insane. Um, and it's quite unlike anything else Britain really has. Um, like, Britain has some board clears. But the fact that you have to play around board clears and a Churchill off right because they're very different things. Because if your opponent, if you're afraid of Carpet Bobbing or Wave After Wave, um, you know, you have put enough units onto the board where you can, like, put some pressure out and try to bait out the Carpet Bobbing and then flood the board later. Uh, if your opponent is going to play Church, if you know your opponent has Churchill off right in hand, um, you play slightly differently. You try to flood the board, you try to get a good, healthy amount of non ground units onto the board if possible. And if not, you try to get as many big units to the front line as possible, spend your turns um, sort of slamming down your high credit stuff if it can get to the front line. And if it's not going to get to the front line, play your low credit stuff in the support line. Uh, so you can replay the low credit stuff for cheap and push up the high credit stuff back into the front line for cheap. Um, so you sort of play differently around Offray than Carpet Bomb, and that makes Offray better because it sort of forces your opponent to have to play around one or the other, and it offers you an additional way to punish people playing around um, some of your cards if they're not playing around other of your cards. And the body it gives you is just really, really powerful. Five attack means it can kill basically anything, and the seven health with heavy armor means it survives hammer, and it's very difficult to trade into. It can often get three, easily three trades out on even like a mid-range deck. Um... Yeah, this card's just absolutely insane. I'm going to have to leave it in S tier, um, but on the lower end of S tier. Then we have Co-Belligerence. This is another elite that came out in Winter War. Uh, and Co-Belligerence is a 7-cost order. Um, shuffle a target enemy unit into your deck. So basically, you take it off the board, and then you put it into your deck. Um, and it's not triggering destruction effects. And you will eventually draw it yourself, so it's giving you an extra card on fatigue. So there's certain matchups where this is one of the best cards in the game. Um, so for example, like if you're playing Britain Control versus Soviet Control and your opponent slams down at 272nd, and then you co-belligerence their 272nd, not only have you destroyed, have you basically suppressed and then destroyed the best unit in their deck, you have now given yourself a copy of that. And also, you are now one further behind on fatigue, or one further ahead on fatigue, um, which the matchup very might, very well might go to. However, there's a lot of matchups that are not going to go to fatigue. There's a lot of matchups where the biggest unit they have in their deck is a four-cost unit, probably like a Dragon Slayer, maybe a five-cost Sheedon, um, and they're just going to kill you before you even reach turn seven. And if you do reach turn seven, they'll probably kill you if you spend your entire turn removing a single unit. Um, so, Co-Belligerence is just a... It's a very powerful effect, but it can't go into S tier just because there will always be some form of aggro decks in the meta that make this card um, sort of the weaker. Like, you can have a card that's absolutely insane that it falls off against certain decks. Um, however, 
if the meta's like 80% aggro, you just will not run co-belligerence. Um, like co-belligerence requires a certain amount of other unit-based control decks. Or not even other, like because you don't necessarily need to be playing a unit-based control deck. But co-belligerence requires either you are playing a very specific fatigue list, or it requires unit-based control decks to be in the meta. Um, so it is a meta call, so we will leave it into A tier, um, rather than putting it up into S tier. However, it is a ludicrously powerful effect, and a scary effect to be in the game. This is a card that 1939 does have to be aware about while creating other cards in the future. Um, now, where in A tier is it better than, say, the Alien Brigade? This is where things start to get hard, because these are two very, very different cards in two very, very different decks. Um... However, I think I'd probably say Co-Belligerence is just a more powerful card. Both of them are kind of matchup dependent. Airline Brigade is less matchup dependent. However, I think Co-Belligerence is a has a much bigger impact on the matchup where it's good. Uh, then we have Comet, a 6 cost, a 6-6. Six, six. Uh, tank Heavy Armor 1 when this deals damage to the HQ Dry card. Um, and this just sort of... It's, this is a weird card. This card has never seen play in any serious deck ever. Because why on earth would Britain ever want a 6 cost 6-6 six, six heavy armor 1 tank that doesn't do anything on play and it doesn't have guard and it doesn't heal. And again, it draws, but it draws if it's hitting the HQ instead of trading um, and you don't need the card draw. So like this is just... Everything about this card is the opposite to anything Britain wants to do. With all of that being said, the effect is not bad, the stats are not bad. Like, unlike, say, the Bowfighter, where you play the Bowfighter on 6, there's a pretty decent chance your opponent just immediately removes it. Um, whereas, you play the Cobbit, and your opponent, there's a lower chance your opponent can immediately remove it. Um, and it also just... I feel like a 6-6 six, six heavy armor, like, if you can get it to the front line, it can eat a lot of trades. Um, it might not be the bomber where it doesn't receive damage when attacking. However, the six means it can trade out into bigger things. Um, particularly hitting that five threshold, that five attack threshold. Um, so I do think Comet is just sort of a good card insofar as, like, if this card existed in any other nation, it would probably be much better. Like, not A tier, but, like, it would probably be, like, high B tier in any other nation. However, it just doesn't fit anything Britain really wants to do. Um, but it's not a terrible card. Like, if you have Comet as one of the other, like, three elites, and you're playing in, like, you know, rank 15, by all means, put Comet in your deck. You're not going to make your deck worse by putting Comet in if you have that low of a collection. Then we have Committed Crew. Um, and Committed Crew is a 10-cost order that makes all Spitfires you deploy this turn cost zero and to get plus three, plus three on deployment. Um... Now, this card is a card that I'm debating between D tier and S tier. Um, and the reason I'm putting it between D tier and S tier is it's n Spitfires is not a supported archetype. Right now, in the game, Spitfires is not supported, and they seem to have... They've rotated most of the Spitfires, and they seem to not really be supporting Spitfires anymore, so I kind of doubt that they're going to print more Spitfire support. I feel like this is sort of the maximum extent of the Spitfire support that we have are going to really receive. And because of that, I think I'm going to put it in D tier because Spitfires just don't have enough. However, the reason I would like kind of want to put it into S tier is just the effect of Committed Crew is absolutely insane. Like if if you play Committed the Commit Committed Crew and then you play four Spitfires. Not only are you probably cheating 10 to 12 credits, you are also cheating 10 to 12 credits and also um, 12, 12 worth of stats. And that is insane. That is just a like a, a immediate, I win the board game next turn if thus you can kill me or you can remove an infinite stat of the board. It's basically an immediate check of do you have a full board clear. Um, and... It also means that if at any point they print a reliable way to give you Spitfire's Blitz, um, then Committed Crew is just going to get absolutely crazy. There's already a way to give you Spitfire Blitz um, with Refit, I think the card's called. Um, and, like, obviously this doesn't reduce the Spitfire op cost, but it, it is just a scary card. It is a scary card that 1939 has to be very aware of. 
uh, when printing additional cards to the game, because Committed Crew is laughably bad until it isn't, and suddenly it's destroying everybody. Like, if Britain can reach turn 10, they win the game, kind of thing. And Britain can reach turn 10. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're going to put it down into D tier, but be, be very afraid of Committed Crew. Um, then we have Wellington. Um, not Wellington. What's this card called? It's the... Um, I'm totally blanking on the name of this card, but it it's a 5 cost, 5, 4 elite tank. Uh, its current version is deployment deal 5 damage to an enemy tank. It used to be um, double damage to tank. So, oh no, it used to be ignores uh, heavy armor. And, and it was like an 8, 4 or an 8, 5 or something. So this t this card is actually, um, I despite the fact that I don't think this card has seen like any play, um, I think this card is quite good. Um, and we're, we're going to put it at the top end of B, just because it is a bit of a meta call card, um, where if there's a lot of tanks in the meta, it's a good card that you want to run in your deck. If there's not a lot of tanks in the meta, it's a good card, but you probably don't want to run it in your deck. Um, like, it, it's ceiling is not earth shattering, um, but its floor is also pretty high. So I think it's just a very good card that you have to look at what other people are playing to decide whether or not it makes the cut as sort of like the 40th card in your deck. Um, and I think that's a pretty good spot for an elite to be. Um, I think this is sort of like the, the standard average decent elite. Um, then we have His Majesty's Chosen. And these cards are always difficult to um, sort of evaluate, but His Majesty's Chosen is a two cost order. Choose one of three of random elite units to add to your hand. So it's basically develop an elite unit from Britain. Um, now, how good are Britain elite units? And the answer is not great. Um, in the current standard rotation, it's gotten better because Bowfighter was rotated um, and uh, Sunderland was rotated. And I think they rotated like one other pretty bad card, uh, like bad elite. Oh yeah, they rotated Ulster Rifles, I think. So it's Magic Chosen, it gets good or like it gets better or worse in standard, um, just because you know, certain cards will be brought in that are really good, certain cards are will leave that are really bad. Um, however, on average, I think Britain is not super high up the list of decks that really want to make use of this, just because British elites aren't necessarily super high in value. Um unlike, say, Soviet elites, and they're not super high in tempo, unlike, say, German elites. Um, they're just sort of, like, good cards to play. Like, they're, they're sort of in the middle ground of between value and tempo um, without reaching any extremes. And there's not, like, any really game-winning elites you can get off of His Majesty's show. So, like, Churchill Offer is probably the closest thing to that. Um... And again, British control decks do not tend to win off of units. So it's, you are likely not running all of the elite, good elite units in any deck to begin with. And I don't think you would want to run His Majesty's Chosen unless you are already running all of the good cards you could get off of it um, to then justify running His Majesty's Chosen for additional copies of the good cards. So with that all being said, I think it is going to end up in B tier. Um... I think it's probably, like, nestled between um, Canadian and Parachute, maybe between Parachute and Comet. Where, you know, like, if it's one of your only elites, it's it's a fine card, put it in your deck, by all means. Um, but once you're getting into the, sort of, the top end of, like, competitive lists, I don't think anybody is realistically going to look at His Majesty's Chosen um, as a real consideration. Then we have HMS Illustrious, and I'm going to put this into S tier. Um, I think this is another close one between S tier and A tier, but I'm going to put it on the, into the lower end of S tier. Just because Britain has so many ways of buffing um, bombers, and they have so many ways of get, you getting good effects out of bombers. And again, this isn't just being based off of what's currently in standard rotation. Empire Strikes is still a card that exists in the game, and very well might come back in the future. Uh, but even if it doesn't, close air support seems like it's going to be a card that's sticking around and close air support's insane um there's other ways to buff this with the um i think the u.s lightning um like the p40 lightning um that or p36 lightning or whatever the number is um that buffs bobber attacks um there's you know you can play the havoc uh to reduce their op cost like 
HMS Illustrious, just being able to summon two bombers with Blitz in Britain is incredibly powerful. This is just going to be one of the dominant cards of any air deck. I don't think any air deck is ever going to cut HMS Illustrious. Um, I can't imagine a world where that is possible. And beyond specific air decks, um, it's also like so powerful that it has seen play outside of air decks. Um, like in control decks that might run this with something like a Paracy um, to just immediately remove something. Or you might run this with World Britannia to immediately get two 5-5 Blitzers that can attack face or trade out. Um, this is fine with like even in Commando decks I've seen this run because it works with Long Range and Desert Group. Um... HMS Illustrious is just a very, very powerful card um, that it might not be like the flashiest win the game on the spot type of card, um, but I think that we should not underestimate this card's absolute insanity um, with all that being said. Then we have Kitty Hawk, and Kitty Hawk is a weird card to evaluate um, because on the one hand, 3 cost, 2-3 fighter deployment deal 2 damage to a ground target, Seems really good. You know, you can it can hit face, it can be a little extra burn, it can trade out with units, you you can play it early in an air deck to get a fighter that protects your cards from your opponent's bombers, um, or just something that's able to put out a little damage. However, the big caveat comes with its op cost of two, and that makes it really, really difficult to use early in the game, and later in the game, this card sort of falls off. You kind of want to be playing this early in the game, particularly in an air deck. However, it falls off very quickly because of the two op cost on the card. If this was a one op cost card, this is easy A tier. Um, however, with two op cost, I think this is just one of those cards that is good enough to play. But as we have seen in air, this is one of the most common cards to cut from air if people want to put anything else in the deck. Um, and it's one of the co most common cards to cut from control lists if you want to put anything else in the deck. So it's a card that sees play in a lot of a wide range of decks. It sees play in control, it sees play in aggro. Um, however, it also gets cut from aggro and gets cut from control. Um, so I'm going to put it as the probably the highest card of B tier. Um, just because I can't realistically put it into A tier in my opinion. I think it's just a card that happens to fit a spot that Britain is missing. I don't think it's a great card. Then we get to Lancaster, um, and Lancaster is another one that's kind of awkward to evaluate. It's a 7 cost, 5-4 Blitz Bomber. When this card hits the opponent's HQ, increase the card cost of all cards in their hand by 1. So this is the, I think the only way, or at least one of the only ways to permanently increase the cost of cards in your, yeah, one of the only ways to permanently increase the cost of cards in your opponent's hand. Um... And certainly the easiest and most reasonable to get to. And that is, on its own, is very, very powerful. Like, if you play the control list, your opponent has, like, you know, seven, eight cards in their hand, and you can play on an empty board, turn 10, land, cast your face, you're probably winning that game. Even if they remove it immediately, you're probably winning that game. However, most of your opponents aren't going to be playing control, and even if they are playing control, the board's rarely going to be cleared by turn 10. And even if it is cleared by turn 10, they might have a low hand um, size. Or you might just have better things to do with your credits. Um, so Landcaster is a card that has seen a lot of play um, in control decks and ramp decks. However, I, again, I'll, I think I just have to put it down into B tier. Like, I don't think... Well... Okay, the effect is kind of insane. Like, this is exactly what you want in a top-end card, where the effect is very, very powerful. My issue is just 10 cost for that. If your opponent has anything on the board, this is hard to use. Um, and your opponent also needs cards in hand for this to be, like, particularly good. Um, now, it can obviously be a finisher. It can just be 5 burst. That's fine. Or it can trade out with a 5 health thing. Um, my issue is that I feel like its stats hold it back from being a truly A-tier card, just because if you don't get the perfect situation, this card kind of falls off pretty quickly. So I'm going to put it down into B-tier, uh, where it's good, um, but it's not an auto-include card. Then we get to Long Range Desert Group, um, and this is a very, very powerful effect. So it's a 5-cost order, give all of your units... When this deals damage to an enemy unit, destroy it. 
Um, and at first thought, you were like, okay, you run this with, like, sort of bombers and an air deck. You know, I mentioned previously HMS Illustrious. But this card is primarily a commandos card because this works on commandos. The, if you you play Long Range Desert Group, you give the effect to all of your commandos, and then the commandos trigger because you played an order. And if your commandos pings any unit, they immediately die. It's kind of the win condition of commandos. Be aware, if you can get a board of commandos that your opponent can't remove and you slap a Long Range Desert Group on them, your opponent can never have units on the board ever again, and you will just eventually win the game through pings. And it is the cornerstone of Commandos, and Commandos is not a particularly good deck. Commandos has not seen a particularly large amount of play. However, Long Range Desert Group is such a ludicrously powerful card. Um, I think I have to put it into A tier, where it, it really is just... The effect is so strong, and it can just board lock your opponent out so easily. And it also can do that against a wide range of decks. Um, like, there are certain control decks, and certain aggro decks, and certain mid-range decks, which can just get immediately board-locked by a decent long-range desert group coming down at really any stage of the game. And with a card that is has that much potential power level, um, it, it has to be in A tier. Uh, this is just a very powerful effect that will only really get better over time, um, because you will only find better ways to trigger this, you know, ways to find it, ways to reduce its cost, um, different units to trigger the effect on, whereas I can't really imagine they're ever going to have easy ways to make your units not die to Long Range Desert Group. Um, so, yeah, I think that's an A-tier card. Then we get to um, the Manchester. It's a 7-cost, 6-4 bomber deployment, add precision bombing to your hand, and precision bombing is a 4-cost order. If you control a bomber, destroy target unit. Um, so this is just a really bad card. It is meant to be just a sort of ramp, high value control card. Um, the issue is it is absolutely awful. It's 11 cost to play it with the thing triggering immediately. And if you play it without the thing triggering immediately, um, then it's a 7 cost, 6, 4, do nothing. Um, and that's awful. That's worse than Bowfighter. Uh, the one reason I'm not putting it into terrible is... You know, if you are in a ramp deck and you can reach 11 credits, then this is basically just like a... It's comparable to a B-17, um, where it's a 9 cost, 5-5, five, five, heavy armor, 1 bomber, destroy a random unit. This is an 11 cost, 6-4 bomber, destroy a specific unit. Um, it's comparable. Um, you could also, like, you know, if you played a lot of bombers, you can slam this on 7, um, just as a threat, and then use the precision bombing with other bombers later in the game. It's it's not a terrible card, but it's not good. It is a, a very decidedly bad card, and it's also been rotated, and I kind of doubt it's coming back. Uh, then we have Monty, and uh, yeah, Monty is an S tier card. So Monty, one cost, order, pin all enemy units. If three or more have been pinned, draw a card. Um, so Monty is just a stupid card, um, and you can play this in every single British deck, it is an auto-include, and it is an amazing card against every single deck, it, it, like, with the exception of Unitless, I guess. Um, if your opponent plays units in their deck, Monty is an insane card, and it is an insane card in every deck. So, yeah, that, that is exactly, like, what an S-tier card needs to be. Monty has already been nerfed, and the nerf was a very substantial nerf, but also, Monty continued to see play in every single British deck, and then they rotated it. Um, if Monty ever comes back into the game, it needs to be nerfed again. Um, it is just an incredibly frustrating card to deal with, and it's so powerful. Just the ability to pin all enemy units for one cost is insane. Uh, and this easily finds synergy with stuff like Forced Surrender, um, or even just like in air, where you could set up a two-turn board where... You know, you, you play Monty, and then you flood the board with bombers, and then on the next turn you buff the attack of all your bombers and swing face for lethal. Um, you can do this in, like, a control deck, where, you know, it's turn six, and your opponent has overwhelming board units on the board, so you play Monty and Glamour Boys, your opponent can't deal any damage to your HQ, and then you play Kyber Bomb and you clear their entire board with a guard still up. Um, Monty's just a ludicrously powerful card. 
Then we get to the Mosquito. Um, and Mosquito is a fun card where it's a six cost four four fighter deployment to deal three damage. It's sort of the big brother of Kitty Hawk, um, where this can hit anything, uh, any t unit type, but it, unlike Kitty Hawk, it cannot hit the HQ. Um, so six cost for a four four fighter deal three damage. Um, I think in my last tier list, I had this in at the lower end of A. Um, and that's just because I think that this is a more reasonable card than Kitty Hawk insofar as I feel like the decks that want to run Mosquito are much more happier running Mosquito than the decks that might run Kitty Hawk. Um, with that being said, I feel like this card might be getting power crept down to a B tier. Um, where I do still think Mosquito is a better elite overall than Kitty Hawk. Um, with that being said, however... For six cost for a four four fighter that deals three damage is not as good as it used to be. Um, I still think I don't think it's bad. Um, but it's maybe not quite an A tier, maybe just high end of B tier. Uh, type of card, but you know, for the sake of the tier list, uh, if we run out of space in B tier, I might put it up into A tier. It's just a solid card that comes down. It's a little weak on the stats and. It's a little weak on the damage for the cost. However, the stats and the damage together usually works out to be a fine card. You can usually remove something good while offering a body that your opponent has to answer. And unlike, say, a bow fighter, they will lose units if they're trading out with it. And a 4-4 is usually enough to trade out with some, at least one thing. Then we have the commando, uh, the elite commando. It's a 6 cost, 3-3 three, three ambush fury when you play an order deal 2 damage. And this card is just kind of bad. Um, I've, like, there are decks that can run it um, where, you know, you're, like, doing Reich's Bank or other sort of forms of, like, ramp, maybe. Um, and, you know, you try to get up to a ton of credits and then you spam out a ton of orders while playing this. The issue with this is, unlike every other commando, this one doesn't have smokescreen, so it will never survive more than one turn. And you kind of don't want to pay, pay six for a card that's going to survive one turn. Um, you have to be confident that you are going to get enough value out of this to re to reasonably play it. Um, and I think the issue is you can never confidently get enough value out of this card outside of very specific decks. Um, so we are going to leave it in C tier. With that being said, um, I think it has a higher chance of seeing play than ATS or Bowfighter or Manchester um, because it has seen play in some fringe decks before. Um, and, you know, if they release more credit sheet, or, um, I think there's actually a decent chance they buff this card, although that's not really gonna factor into where I place the current version on this tier list. Um, but yeah, we're gonna put it down here. Then we have Oxford. And Oxford is a 2 cost 1-3 fighter. When both, whenever a unit, a ground unit is deployed, set its attack equal to its health. And this is a universal effect to both players. Um, so Oxford is just a really bad card. There's very few ways to make it work for you. And even if you can make it work for you, it will often work for your opponent as well. Um, and if you build your entire deck around making it work for you, there's a very high chance you just never find Oxford. There's no way to fish for Oxford. Um, so yeah, it's, it's supposed to be played in like a naval support, make attack equal to health type of deck. However, this doesn't work retroactively. It has to be on the board first, which means your opponent can remove it, or it means, and it's an elite, and so it could just be that you never draw it. Um, so it, even in a naval support deck, like even if a naval support, um, is support the word I'm looking for? It's not naval power. Yeah, I think naval support's the word I'm looking for. Um, even in that deck, I'm not even sure you run Oxford. Like, you might. But you, you might not. And the fact that you consider cutting the elite in a specific archetype that doesn't see play means it's, it's just a terrible card that is also not supported. Then we get Pioneer Company, um, which has recently been nerfed. Prior to the nerf, I would say it's an S-tier card. Um, Post-nerf, I think it's down to an A-tier card. It's still a very good card. I think a lot of people drastically overestimated how bad it would be um, following the nerf. 
Um, and then of course the no version is the first order of each turn costs one less, which means it can go to zero. However, it will only ever reduce the cost of one card per turn. I saw a lot of people say, well, this is just worse War Machine. Um, well, I'd respond with two things. One, War Machine is not a British card. And two, this gets better later in the game. Because like, if you play a War Machine, if you draw a War Machine later in the game, it's not going to do anything. Also, this is going to be able to allow you to um, cheat cards out from one to zero, which is quite good. So you can cheat cards out the turn you play it. Um, whereas it, you don't have to like wait for the following turn. Um, so, you know, it's not just, oh, strictly worse War Machine. And even if it was strictly worse War Machine, War Machine's a really good card. Like, would you not run a War Machine? It, like, just in a British deck, if you had a one cost War Machine, I think you'd probably run it. Um, so yeah, it's going to go down into A tier. Now, we're in A tier. Um, I think it's probably, like, around the Airland Brigade. Um, I don't think it really has as much just immediate game-winning power as it used to. Um, with that being said, I think Credit Cheat is probably slightly better than Attack Buff. Um, so we will put it here. Then we get to British Research, Royal Research. Um, now this is a card that I previously put into S tier. Um, and I think a lot of people probably were a bit confused by that. Um, and, you know, then it was rotated for a bit and just came back in the Covert Operations expansion. Um, and it's not seen a ton of play without shaking up the meta. So where will I put it now? Um, I'm leaving it in S tier. This card is just absolutely insane. Um, it's worse than Monty, but I think it's better than Avery, um, uh, just in terms of a, a raw power level. Um, maybe worse than Avery, but it's certainly better than HMS Illustrious. And, uh, we're gonna leave it here. So, the, it, the thing that makes Royal Research absolutely insane is that there is never a matchup or a deck where it is bad in, and it also gives you a lot of options to play with. So, if you're against an aggro deck, you just slam Royal Research as a three-cost, heal four, draw a card. You are absolutely fine playing that card in your deck. And if you're playing against any sort of control deck and you, like, have a bad hand, you still might very well do that. However... There is going to be situations where you are playing a control deck against an aggro deck or a mid-range deck, um, and you draw it later in the game, and you've had a lot of defensive tools, but they're slowly building up a board, and then maybe you can go all the way to Bletchley Park and play Bletchley Park and immediately win the game. Um, now, that's not going to happen a ton of the time, but it's going to happen some of the time, and you can run that in your deck and go for that win condition some of the time, well, most of the time still having a good card that is cheap and can be played against any deck for cheap. Um, and you might be against a control deck where you go for the, um, I, I forget the name, but the, the third option where you pin all enemy units and increase the cost of every card in your opponent's hand by three. And you just like absolutely brick their hand and then you win on tempo against a deck that might be slower and greedier than yours. Or maybe, and probably the most often you know, um, in a wide range of decks, you just keep it for the synthetic rubber because synthetic rubber is probably one of the single strongest research options in the game um, because it is just absolutely insane. So synthetic rubber is give a unit plus four, um, it's give it plus four health and then set attack equal to health. So at the minimum, it is a zero cost plus four plus four. Um, I, I actually, I guess like if the attack is already higher than the health, it can get worse than that. Um, and I know a lot of people like to look at research and say, well, it's a nine cost plus four plus four. Well, that's not true because you can put the nine credits into that and then just have the synthetic rubber in your hand and then save it for a different turn. Um, so like you can develop, get synthetic rubber, say on like by turn six. Um, and then later in the game, you do HMS illustrious synthetic rubber. Now you have a seven, seven and a one, three, and then you do a cast and suddenly you burst in 10 damage for what? What is that? Six credits? Six credits, ten damage? Pretty good. Um, and it also means if you're playing a control deck and you're running things like Black Watch, it just means a Black Watch in the front line at any point of the game where you have 11 credits could just mean your opponent immediately dies if you have uh, Research Synthetic Rubber, make a 10-10, Fury, kill them. Um, so yeah, Royal Research, absolutely insane card. I'm leaving it in S tier. Um, and I know this might be one of my hottest takes so far, but... Um, yeah, the, the Royal Research is insane. You should probably be running Royal Research in most, if not every British deck, um, if you own the card.
However, again, this is not a crafting guide. I'm not telling you you should craft the card if you don't have it. But if you do have it, you should be running the card. Then we have Rural Britannia. Um, and this is sort of a sad card to talk about because it is a 8 cost. Give all of your British units plus 2 health and then set attack equal to health. Um, so this is sort of meant to be the British win con of a board based slow grindy deck with like lots of guards lots of high health guards um or it is supposed to be the win condition of a commandos type of deck where you're running a ton of cup of teas and you're going to be getting like you know these two seven two nine crusaders and honeys and these two seven commandos and whatnot and then you suddenly set all of them to nine nines and that's sort of the big thing you do with commando and when this card came out for a while afterwards, Real Britannia was really popular and it was doing both of those things. It was a, it was sort of the win con of most British decks. Um, however, this card has been power crept so heavily since then um, that it's nearly unplayable. I know some people still try to make it work just because it is very powerful in combination with HMS Illustrious. Um, but other than like as a bizarre win con, um, it's still just kind of a weak card i think if it ever comes back there's a very good chance they will buff it and i don't think it needs that much of a buff to become a really good card like this at six is insane this at seven is probably enough that people are going to try it at the very least um however it, it is has not been buffed so i have to evaluate it as it is currently written and as it is currently written i think it is going to go down into c tier um high c tier like, I think it's low B-tier, high C-tier card, where it's like, there's decks you can build to make it good. It's just the issue is those decks are not good, and those decks are not going to become good. <laughs> um, So, we're going to leave it um maybe above Commandos. Um, Actually, maybe one below Commandos. I think Commandos probably see it has a slightly better chance of seeing play, Um, even if Rural Britannia were still in standard rotation. And then we have Sexton. Um, and I think Sexton is a low or high A, low S tier card where it's just such a stupidly powerful card um, that fits into every single British deck. Because just a 5 cost, 3, 4 artillery deployment permanently pin a unit for as long as Sexton is on board. It's just an insane effect. Because if you play it, it's a 5 cost, 3, 4 artillery deployment pin a unit. And if your opponent removes it, oh well. That's still a very good card, and your opponent probably had to drop premium removal on it. If it sticks at all, you'd probably just win the game. Like, if it sticks for, like, two turns, you're so far ahead. It's such a ludicrously powerful card um, that can just uh, brick out games entirely on its own. The number of times I've seen a British deck, like, be basically out of cards, they, they're looking like they're gonna lose... There's not anything they can do. And then they slam like a Sexton with a couple other units. And the Sexton can be removed immediately. But the pin plus the other units plus the need to remove Sexton is enough to give the British deck like a one turn tempo advantage. That lets them close out the game in a game they were otherwise completely lost in. That happens all the time. Sexton is such a stupidly strong card. Um, In fact, it's probably better than HMS Illustrious. I think it's less powerful in game running on its own than Churchill Avre, just because it is much easier to remove, and the three attack does bring it into range of stuff like Honorable Death. Um, but Sexton is a easy S-tier card. This card is absolutely insane, and if any other nation had it, they would run it in every single deck, and Britain runs it in basically every single deck. Then we have Shelling, Monty's um, sort of cousin where it's a 5-cost order, deal 1 damage to all enemy units, and pin them, and the opponent loses a credit slot. Um, so this was run in basically every single British deck when it was in standard rotation, and it's never been nerfed for some reason. Um, and this is a card where it's not as good as Monty, um, because Monty is, for one, 4 credits cheaper, two, it draws a card, um, however, the two big things that Shelling has that Monty doesn't have is, one, Shelling actually damages the units, which in certain cases can be very important, and two, Shelling reduces a credit slot, so if you can play Shelling on five, you are savaging the opponent. It's brutal. Shelling on five is one of the craziest things you can do, uh, and I talk a lot about strap bombing on six, but unlike strap bombing on six, Shelling on five is never a bad play, because... Worst case scenario, 
you have pinned every unit on your opponent's board, and they've lost a credit slot. Like, the, the, the worst case scenario is non-existent. Because sometimes you don't want to strap bombing on six because your opponent has three units in the front line and they're just going to kill you if you strap bombing on six. Shelling, no amount of board presence will make shelling bad. The only thing that, like, would make it bad is if they have no units on the board. And in that case, you might not want to do shelling on five. You might still want to do shelling on five, depending on what deck you're playing. But you might not want to do shelling on five because your opponent has no units. But you're winning that game anyways. And then you still have shelling in hand if you choose not to play it. Um, so yeah, shelling, stupid, stupid card. I'm glad it's gone, and I hope it never comes back in its current iteration. Um, probably... I think it's probably worse than research um, on its own in terms of peak power level. Um, and as particularly now that self-credit denial has, or the, not self-credit denial, the regular credit denial has been butchered, um, and not just rotated, but, like, particularly the Observer Corner, um, has made that deck less viable, so this is less of a win con on its own. It's still just a stupidly powerful card, um, so it's sort of between Avre. Um, is it better than Avre? I think it's probably better than Avre just because it comes out sooner, and Avre, there's certain decks that might not run Avre just because their curve is lower, whereas every British deck will run sex er, Shelling, because it's insane. Uh, and then we have another insane card. We have Sincerely Yours. Um, and this is a card that uh, I haven't rated previously, because this is one of the newer cards. This came out in Brother in Arms, I believe. Um, maybe Winter War. And Sincerely Yours is just a stupidly powerful card. So four, cred four credits, gain six HQ defense, draw two cards. So it's basically like a fortification and a convoy staples together, and you're only playing, paying, like, one extra cost for basically the two cards combined. Um, now, Fortification is not a card that you would run in a lot of British decks. Convoy is a card you would run in basically every British deck. Um, so you're not going to complain about essentially a Fortification stapled on to a one-cost higher Convoy. Um, this is just an incredibly powerful card. Now, is it S-tier? It is just, like, a... It's a broken card in terms of if you compare it to what uh, how other things are costed in this game, it is just way too undercosted. Like it's just stupidly powerful. Um, in terms of like what you get for what you pay. However, card draw and HQ are not win conditions in of themselves. Like this doesn't affect tempo, and tempo is the primary win condition of most decks. Um, so, it's a, like, it is a stupid card. I just don't know if I can put it into S tier, because it's just, like, it, it's not winning the game on itself. There are tons of times where you will draw Sincerely Yours and lose after playing it, or draw Sincerely Yours and never really have the chance to play it and lose. Um, that being said, it's still run in every single British deck. Um, so we'll put it at the top of A tier. But I don't think it makes it into S tier just because there's few decks that are really going to take a ton of advantage of, um, the resources you are getting, um, for this undercosted card. Then we have Spitfire. Um, so the Spitfire is a 4 cost 4-4 four, four fighter deployment to get plus 2, plus 2 if your opponent has another, if your opponent controls an air unit and gain fury if they don't. Um, so... This is a card that has seen some nerfs, and a lot, some people really like this card in air, some people really like this card in basically every single British deck. Uh, I've seen it in ramp, I've seen it in control, and I've run it in ramp, I've run it in control, I've run it in decks where I don't have a high fighter count, and sometimes you just want to slam a 6-6 six, six fighter on turn 4 or turn 3 with War Machine to block bombers, or trade one for one with Dragon Slayer, something like that. Um, however, there's... A lot of matchups where Spitfire is not great. Um, you can run it in air decks and, you know, buff it, and it can become a bit of a threat, just because, like, if you, you know, have a 4-4 Fury, you give a cast, it's a 5-5 Fury, that can threaten a lot of damage very quickly. It's a removal check. Um, so, like, the question is, is it B tier, is it A tier? I think it's probably v on the low end of A tier. Um, just because it's not as good of a card as it used to be. It used to be a broken card. Um, 
in its current iteration, it's probably good enough to consistently see play and consistently consider play. It's sort of similar to this 5-cost five 5-4 five tank that I'm still forgetting the name of. Um, Chaffee? No, not Chaffee. Um, yeah, no, Chaffee's the US one. Um, and that's going to bother me for the rest of the time. Um, but anyways, the, the Spitfire, it, it's good enough to see play. Um, you know, it, it's a good body. Um, it, it comes out here fine. If you have the card, feel free to throw it into basically any deck you have if you're low with collection. Um, however, it's similarly to the Kitty Hawk and the Mosquito, it's not an auto include by any means. Um, it's probably a little bit better at what it accomplishes against the things it's trying to be good against. Um, like, I feel like, unlike Kitty Hawk and Mosquito, which are both just good against everything, but not amazing type cards, Spitfire is amazing against some things and slightly worse than Kitty Hawk and Mosquito against other things. Um, however, the... the f I feel like being amazing against some things is going to push a card up, um, just because you are going to run this when it is amazing, and you are going to be playing this when it is amazing. Um, and that is just going to make it a higher tier card, in this case, a A tier card. Then we have Sunderland. Um, and Sunderland is a very fun card that I think a lot of people probably drastically over, um, estimate. It's a 6 cost 2 6 bomber at the start of your turn draw a card. I actually forgot if it's the start or the end of your turn. Um, that <laughs> does drastically change how good the card is. Um, but it, the fact that I can't even remember shows how much how little play it has seen um when it came out i i did try to make it work in a lot of world britannia decks because you play sunderland and then it sticks and then you're making it an 8-8 eight eight and it's a big win condition but similarly to ats it uh it, britain just has better draw options so why are you playing a low statted unit that gives you card draw rather than just playing card draw and better units with that being said, a 2-6 is very easy to keep alive, um, and once on the board, it, there's things it can do. Um, also, something that I just realized that, uh, that, um, no, never mind, never mind. Um, but yeah, I, I think a lot of people would probably put Sunderland in terrible, in D tier. And I think it's better than that. Um, I think in a low collection, I think Sunderland's fine, because if it doesn't stick, it's 6 cost heal 6, so that's not amazing. But I think it's reasonably going to stick if you're playing a deck with a lot of guards. Um, and, you know, like, any attack buff on this, and it's good. And even if it's not an attack buff, like, but if you're cheating it out in a ramp deck, it's fine. Um, because you're sort of getting your card draw for free without having to spend credits on it, and then you could use your credits on board plays and stuff. And I don't think it's a terrible card. Like, I don't think it's substantially um, worse than, like, say, Manchester or Bowfighter. And in fact, I think it's probably arguably better than Manchester and Bowfighter. It's I, it's worse than ATS, but it's it's down here in the C tiers. Uh, then we have Commonwealth, and this is a fun card because I feel like a lot of people are gonna slam Commonwealth in the S tier card, uh, in, in the S tier category, um, because of just how much play it has seen before it was rotated. Uh, however, I think Commonwealth is an A tier card. And th there's a couple of reasons for it. I think common the reason a lot of people would lead to putting Commonwealth in an S tier. Um, in the S tier is because they view the effect and the power of decks that run Commonwealth as very, very high. But I feel like that's based on the power level of other British cards being insane that enable Commonwealth to be in S, like, to be in S tier decks. Um, I don't think the effect of Commonwealth is on its own a particularly broken effect. Just because... 20 damage, if your opponent's running healing, they can very easily heal out of range of Commonwealth, so you can't rely on Commonwealth as just a win-the-game card. Um, and if your opponent isn't running healing, then they are probably running a deck that is going to be able to try to consistently put you under pressure. Um, so it's a win condition that your opponent is aware about and has interaction with by, you know, trying to deal as much damage as possible, trying to balance the hit HQ versus set up boards to be able to hit HQ for more on the other other turns, um, trying to get the most damage out of their cards. So I think it's just a very strong card that, it, like, it's a cornerstone to a lot of decks. A lot of decks are built around Commonwealth, but I don't think Commonwealth is the broken card in those decks. Um, with that being said, 
where in A tier am I going to place it? Um, probably between Pioneer and Airline and Brigade. Maybe above Pioneer, um, just because of the nerf. Where I think it's a, it's a powerful card. Um, don't get me wrong, but it's just not quite there for me in terms of just being a broken card. Um, I have not seen a convincing argument for why Commonwealth is a broken card. Then we have the Royal Ulster Rifles, and uh, this is actually a very funny card, because this is a card that saw a decent amount of play when it came out. It's a 4-cost 2-7 smokescreen when your HQ would take damage, damage Royal Ulster Rifles instead. So it's basically like a 4-cost four fortification that comes down in the form of a unit, which gives it some benefits and some downsides. The benefits being if you can... You can turn unit health buff into healing, basically. Um, the downside is if it can make your opponent turn unit removal into damage. Um, so yeah, it is just a absolutely terrible card. Um, there's not really ever any way you can build a deck around making this not suck. And as more and more pieces of removal have been added to the game, it's become easier and easier for a wide range of decks to immediately make this a essentially four cost do nothing um and even if they can't remove it if they just attack face you've just basically played a fortification um and except it's you spade you paid one more for that fortification and it's not a british order so it's not triggering stuff like um crusader it can't be reduced by stuff like pioneer or aerial reconnaissance it is just wildly worse than a card that only sees super fringe play also, unlike Fortification, Royal Ulster Rifles doesn't actually increase your health for stuff like Commonwealth or a push OTK. Um, it only prevents damage. I guess it... No, it wouldn't even work with a push OTK because then you would your HQ wouldn't be taking damage. Um, so yeah, it's just a absolutely terrible card. Um, that is just a bad card to play. Then we have Ultra, and Ultra is a very powerful card. Um... I don't think it's S tier powerful, but I think it's a very solidly A tier powerful card. Just because it's a card you can run in basically any deck, and three costs for a character measure is you're reaching the point where it's very hard to hide the fact that you have it. And it's very likely, like, if you are forced to hold it up multiple turns, you're wasting a ton of credits very, very quickly. However, Ultra's trigger condition, your opponent playing an order, is very, very, very easy to trigger. Um, and all because it is such an important thing, just having Ultra can essentially buy you in a whole other turns. Like, for example, if you're worried about Death of Winter and it's turn five and you had a really strong early start um, and you're worried about a Death of Winter coming out and just on your board, just hold up Ultra. And your opponent can't play Death of Winter. Because there's always zero cost order they are running. They don't have the credits to do like a sickle depth of winter thing to check for ultra. Um, so either one of two things will happen. Either they throw depth of winter and then you counter it. So no, they no longer have that card in their deck. You no longer have to play around that removal and you draw a card. Or they will do something else. Now, the great thing about ultra is you don't have to have ultra in your hand. Or you might not even necessarily have to hold up ultra. If you think your opponent's going to play around it, um, just because just the threat of Ultra existing means that at, if at any point you pass on three credits, your opponent is going to either not play orders or try to like dump weaker orders from their hand to play around Ultra, potentially. Um, so yeah, just the threat of Ultra existing is incredibly powerful. It's a very strong card when you're triggering it. It's a very strong card when it's not even in your hand or necessarily even in your deck if you play it on ladder. Um... So yeah, I'm going to put Ultra up here. I think one under Sincerely Yours, just because Sincerely Yours doesn't have the effect of uh, needing your opponent to have specific cards in hand. Um, you know, sometimes Ultra's bad because your opponent's top decking and their deck is unit heavy. Um, or sometimes it's bad because you're just dead on board and it's not a board player. <laughs> uh, and it's not an immediate draw. So yeah, Ultra up very solidly A tier. Um, then we have Wave After Wave. And this is... A, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty, it's between A tier and S tier. I think we're going to drop it into the bottom of S tier. Um, Wave After Wave is the, a card from Covert Operations, so it is one of the newest elite cards um, added to Britain. 
So it, we're still sort of figuring out just how strong it is, but I think based on what I have seen, is it is just an incredibly powerful card. Um, now it's a weird card to compare to Carpet Bombing, um, because wave after wave, it's dealing four if you have played another order. So it's on six, it is always going to be two damage. Outside of ramp, or if you have a pioneer company on the board, um, which are two things that are not um, inconsequential. However, um, you know, if you triggered it on turn seven, it's a two card combination of two, whereas carpet bombing is just the one card for three damage versus four damage. The issue is four damage over three damage is such an important break on unit health. Um, it's oftentimes the the difference between leaving the board with a ton of units left over or fully wiping the board against a lot of decks. So wave after wave, I think it's just better with Kyber Bombing. Um, and it is a one of those AoEs where it's an elite, but it's an elite that your opponent always has to be aware of and afraid of to a further extent than Kyber Bombing. Um, so even if it is slightly harder to trigger, it's a card that you're, is going to wipe your opponent out and it's also going to be a card that your opponent has to play around. Um, that being said, I don't think it's nearly as good as, say, Sexton or Avery, um, just in terms of raw power level against other stuff. Just a raw AoE order is never going to be as good as a like very hefty unit that also does something when you play it. Um, but I think Wave After Wave is a solidly low S tier card. Um, it's sort of in a similar vein as HMS Illustrious, and probably slightly better than HMS Illustrious, just in terms of um raw power level although it's difficult to compare the two and then last but not least we have a wellington and wellington is a seven cost four three bomber with blitz that gets its cost reduced by two every time you play an order while this is in your hand and wellington has seen a ton of play in basically every single british deck ever because you run it in air because you run a lot of cheap orders and you have british air unit buffs um you run it in control because you just want any sort of tempo play and blitz removal blitz um burn damage it works with um halifaxes and ramp and you're going to be running this in a lot of combo decks just because combo decks are largely entirely order oriented um so this can be like either if commonwealth is a win condition it can be a little chip damage in through the healing or it can act as a little bit of removal it's very easy to get its cost down to zero Wellington is just an absolutely insane card. Um, and yeah, is it an S tier card? I don't think so, just because a 4 3, even if you get it out for free, is very easy to remove. And 4 is. Like, 4 on an AoE is good because it destroys all the 4 health things. 4 on a single attack thing, yes, you can trade out with a 4 cost thing, and then it, this gets traded out immediately, so you've essentially just played a like tactical strike on the front line um i don't think it's super flashy it's much more it's much better than a tactical strike because obviously it can stick around it can hit the hq immediately uh, i can trigger stuff like halifax um so it's definitely an a or s tier card i don't think it makes it into s tier um however it's going to be on the higher end of a tier cards um somewhere around the commonwealth range i think um yeah, maybe between Commonwealth and Pioneer Company is a good place for this. So that brings us to the end of uh, the tier list here. Um, this is my tier list. Again, this is entirely my opinion. And again, this is absolutely not a crafting guide. Do not just immediately go out and start crafting the S tier cards and then the A tier cards and then the B tier cards. Um, if you want advice on how to craft, uh, ask in the comments down below or join my Discord. Um, ask me there, ask someone else there, join the just cards discord i'm sure there's a ton of people over there who are willing to help you out um but yeah this is going to be the start of uh sort of an update to this series i will go over all five nations um if there's any other things you want me to consider covering in a tier list format please let me know down below uh subscribe if you haven't liked the video comment share all the youtube things um if you are able to please consider donating to the link in the description to everyone who has already donated thank you very much it means a lot and it helps quite a bit and uh, that is going to be it from me for this one. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch all of y'all in the next one.